super excited to have you all here today as we dive into the crucial aspects of database security that are essential for protecting modern applications. Before we dive into the details, let me introduce our speakers for today. Uh, first, we have Matt Henderson, a principal solution architect at Fauna. Matt has a wealth of experience in databases, starting as a DBA, moving into management and architecture roles. Um, he brings extensive knowledge across relational, analytical, and document databases. Next, we have Eric Pintor, um, a senior staff engineer at Fauna. Eric has been a senior engineer for over a decade and is responsible for driving Fauna's core database functionality. He's also the author of Fauna's dynamic attribute-based access control feature that we'll explore later today. And finally, I'm Wyatt Winzel. I've been supporting database and application implementations for over eight years, uh, including over six years consulting on Oracle database and ERP implementations. And I will be your host for today's session. Here's what we, what we have lined up for today. Uh, first, we'll explore the evolving threat landscape and why traditional security measures are no longer sufficient. We'll then discuss the inherent weaknesses in legacy database models and uh, introduce modern solutions to overcome those challenges. Next, Eric will walk us through a practical demonstration of how Fauna's advanced security features work in real world scenarios. And finally, we'll open the floor to your questions uh, to ensure you leave with a clear understanding of how to enhance your database security. Uh, you'll notice a Q&A uh, chat box at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to add questions as they arise and we'll, we'll cover them at the end of the session. Uh, lots of exciting content to cover, so let's get started. Um, to set the stage for our discussion today, let's address one of the most, I, I'd say, critical challenges in data security, and that's the reliance on uh, the application layer for protection. Uh, this approach can create significant vulnerabilities because once a malicious actor obtains someone's identity and credentials, they can bypass application layer security and directly access the, da the database, uh, exposing sensitive customer data. Uh, identities become a key target for hackers because it provides a gateway into your systems. To fully protect against this, it's essential to understand permissions and the full scope of access. And this means knowing who can take what action on which data at what time. Um, implementing security directly at the database layer ensures that even if an identity is compromised, the data remains protected through granular permissions and access controls. Um, by aligning database security with broader security protocols, we can significantly reduce the risk and scope of breaches and ensure a more secure environment for your data. With that context, let's talk a bit more about the current state of the security landscape. Um, it goes without saying that data breaches continue to proliferate. Uh, one that's, of course, top of mind is, is the recent Snowflake data leak, which sounds like is mainly related to limited multi-factor authentication enforcement. However, another recent high-profile uh, breach includes Ticketmaster, uh, where malicious actors were able to move laterally through a database once they had access. The key point here is that security can't be centralized or have a single point of failure. Uh, the data, database needs to be aligned with the broader stack to effectively handle the volume and variety of uh, modern attack vectors. We need to transition ultimately from, from the old castle and moat model to a zero-trust approach for data secured robustly um, at every layer. Our discussion today will focus on three specific areas where database models face significant challenges, uh, stateful authentication, stack authorization, and manual data isolation. Um, first, stateful authentication. Uh, this method is non-real time and struggles with scaling challenges, leading to potential security gaps and inefficiencies as it relies on maintaining sessions, uh, which can become a bottleneck and are vulnerable to session hijacking. Uh, next, static authorization is often too coarse-grained and also not real-time, uh, potentially, potentially increasing the blast radius of breaches. Uh, static authorization policies often can adapt to dynamic user roles and permissions, resulting in either over-permissioning or under-protection. Um, and finally, data isolation, commingling Data either leads to compliance risks or significant operational overhead. Uh, traditional models often lack fine-grained data, fine uh, data isolation, making it challenging to segregate data appropriately, um, which can result in non-compliance with regulations like GDPR or HIPAA and create complex error-prone processes uh, to ensure data integrity. To truly protect your data and achieve the principle of least privilege, 
you need to ultimately secure data at source, the, the database. Um, and now I'll hand it over to Matt Henderson, who will dive into the details of these points and explore uh, how to address these challenges. Matt, over to you. Thank you. So first, it's important to understand a little bit more about what Fauna is as we begin to dive into the security items that we've added to databases. So in the beginning, when we first looked at building an all new database, um, what we wanted to do, our intent was to build a modern database, a database for the modern era. And the way we look at that is one, databases should be easy. You know, it shouldn't be a huge component to your architecture that you have to configure and provision and manage and monitor and maintain. It should be easy to read and write your data and you should be focusing on your apps. So to that, we built a serverless database um, so you don't have to do any of the admin and provisioning work. Um, and then we um, deployed it over a cloud API. So much like other services, you can just connect straight to the cloud API and you don't have to worry about routing um, or any of the performance or latency issues um, centered around routing your database. Behind the scenes, um, we built an all new distributed transaction engine. Um, what this allows you to have is high concurrency, low latency um, transactions at scale. Um, we've auto, um, we always deploy over three different sites of your choice with automatic replication tied up on the back end, uh, it's synchronous replication, and all replicas are active active. And this delivers strongly consistent acid transactions um, on all transactions. So all you have to do is point to our cloud API, launch your reads and writes, and you don't have to be worried about the administration piece or, or having native acid uh, transactions on the back end. Everything's nice and simple. Um, then the other huge component we wanted to add was the security component. Um, we noticed that there's more and more um, folks looking to steal data and data lives in the database. And so we really believe you need to secure your data inside the database. So we're really aiming for securing your data at its source. Um, so with that, so walking down the stack of what goes inside a database related to security, um, there's like three different layers to it. One layer is connectivity, how secure is the connection and the login authentication piece um, and the in-flight um, aspects of logging into a database. We'll go over that. Authorization, once you're inside the database, what access controls do you have? And we felt this is a really, really large spot where innovation was, was available. Most people are using traditional RBAC or rollback or role-based access. We figured that was a, a strong area for innovation. Um, and then lastly, um, a lot more B2B SaaSs um, or, or, um, or implementations out there where native uh, or multi-tenancy is required. And so we wanted to build in aspects to make multi-tenancy extremely easy to produce that data isolation that your compliance and governance probably wants. And then to tie it all together, we built a document relational database. So this gives you all the flexibility of using JSON documents, but it also gives you the power of relations by being able to do things like joins uh, and schema enforcement. And that is part of what makes the security implementation so easy is that we actually have the power of document and relational all in one database. So continuing down the stack, let's double click on connectivity. So some of the challenges um, with databases in general is they have stateful connections. You log into them. And when you log into them, something has to remember that state. And that's typically gonna end up being some sort of memory footprint or whatnot in the, in, the, in the database. That means you can only have a limited number of people um, that are logged in, which then forces you probably to do something like implementing middleware. Um, and then all of your apps log into the middleware and the middleware handles the connection to the database. That put, takes you from two tier to three tier. Um, that increases your tax surface area. Um, so a middleware solution um, definitely helps um, in connection pool management, but it doesn't solve one of the two main problems, which is statefulness. When you log in, you're given a security context and that becomes fixed. So the two challenges in connectivity are, are scale um, and, and state and long live state. Um, and even putting middleware in there is not gonna, um, it can help you with scale, but it's not gonna help you with real time um, uh, access control. So what we decided to do <clears throat> was be more like a service talking to a service. So we use more of the, uh, state, um, the stateless bear token model. So instead of creating a long lived connection to the database, what you do when you log into Fauna is that login creates a token and that token has a secret, which is then included uh, in all routing. So at that point, you have a much more internet style login system and a more scalable system as you're passing the secret inside an HTTPS packet. 
So you automatically get point-to-point uh, -point encryption with HTTPS. Um, and now that your security state is stored in a token stored in the database, it's now limitless. Um, so now you have scale and you have point to point. So you now have the ability to have a two tier system and with a two tier system, your, your deployed application, be that on a phone or a browser can now directly log into the database without having to route to a central location or deal with middleware. So you're reducing the attack surface area and you're building a login system that's, that's uh, more native to application developers and it's going to allow a real-time component. And uh, the real-time component here, I'll explain in a second when we get to authorization. So the next step down, once you've logged in and you have this identity in this token, traditional databases usually are using role-based access. That's role-based, meaning you're grouping many people together, which means any one login can potentially see more data than, the, than what you would like or what any one user wants. So fine grain is not a role. <clears throat> fine grain is user grained. Um, so at this point, um, in order for humans to easily manage uh, access controls, we're making it um, role based. So that was a limited number of, of roles. Um, but at this point, <clears throat> you're actually al allocating too many permissions to any one role. And if somebody were to steal those credentials, they have the potential um, to see more data than they should. And what normally happens then is you say, okay, that's not secure enough. I'll actually add security to my applications. But by adding security to your applications, somebody can steal that credential and go around the application. So as long as you have a login in your database that can see too many records, eventually that could happen. So a role based is not fine grained enough. And it's also not dynamic. When you allocate that role, that role has been allocated. Um, and then when you log in with a long security context, you're going to have that role for the duration of the context. So, so it's not real time and it's too coarse grain. So what we've done is when you log in with your token, in a typical database, a user is going to have a record. Each account for a login is going to have a record. And that record is then going to be statically stored. What we've done is the user collection is actually a user-defined collection. And so every account that you create is going to end up being a document. And that document is mutable and changeable. It can be whatever you want. So you can add static and dynamic attributes to this document and you can build it out to be whatever you want. Each time somebody logs in and gets that token, we assign the user's document to that. You, you, in a stateless model, you can put your phone down, come back 20 minutes later, an hour later as you choose, and it's stateless. Every single time that you call Fauna, we're going to reevaluate what roles you get. And so therefore you have the ability to dynamically grant or not grant a role or any of the users. So the concept of adding identity and context, that's one of the big challenges that role that our back does not have is there's no concept of context. Either in our back, you either have a role or you don't have a role. With Fauna in our dynamic ABAC, we can use context to determine whether or not you get that role. And that can be based off of time or IP address or something that changes. It can also be based off of the data that you're doing. So we can assign roles dynamically in every single call. <clears throat> what this allows you to do is end up delivering user grained uh, control and move all of your security into the database. By taking all of your data security and moving it into the database, you've now secured it at its source. And by adding context to your, uh, the ABAC piece has three different dimensions, data, identity, and context. By adding context to your permissions, what you're doing is you're actually invalidating those credentials um, or their value. Why steal somebody's credentials if they're not always available? With RBAC, once you steal that credential, you always have access to that data. So somebody in a different country or a different time zone can have access. But once you add context to the to permissions, you now have the ability to devalue the theft of a credential. If you're not in the right, if you don't have, if you're not at the right whitelist IP address, if you're not badged in, if you're not at work, if it's past 5 p.m., you can put controls inside the database to make it to where you can't see the data without certain context. And that means somebody, the credentials are no longer valuable um, should you um, um, buy them on the open internet or whatnot. So this allows you to move your security into the database um, so people can't circumvent it the naps, apps, and then it reduces the blast radius because you have the ability to not allow certain operations based off of the identity, the data, or the context of the user. 
And then lastly in the stack was isolation. Very common these days to have more and more multi-tenant type apps or, or compliance uh, wants you to have data isolation for, for your different users. Traditional databases are designed around a single database model where you allocate a single database um, and trying to align a single database to each of your tenants or each of your federated application platforms can be a challenge because you kind of have to thickly provision it. You have to either allocate a cluster or allocate a database. You have to allocate resources to it. So it's a very manual intervention uh, and it leads to the potential of over allocation of resources. If every database or every cluster needs to have provision resources, you may end up having massive over provisioning in order for, so one, you have mal intervention and two, you have the potential for over resource allocation. So what we decided to do um, was make database provision easy. So we took database from being a thickly provisioned object to make it a logical container. <clears throat> so it's a logical container <clears throat> with parent child relationships. So now what you can do is you can near infinitely create new databases. They're immediately instantiated. And then every single connection, whenever that token logs in, every single connection is automatically scoped to just one database. So all you have to do to create multi-tenancy is when that token, when that login, when the user comes in to grab a token, you just scope them to the database they're assigned to. And at that point, they're automatically scoped. What that allows you to do is write a application that can automatically, in the background, provision new databases without manual intervention. You don't have to provision any resources. Um, you can just load DDL straight into it to put in whatever standard tables need to be in there, but it can be immediately instantiated. And then you can log then you immediately scope every one login scope to database anyways. So you can just scope that database to that tenant's database. So therefore your applications can be coded once and then they can be used for any number of tenants. So this is kind of the, the, the three layers of security and how it applies to the database. So as you're attempting to build applications and modern platforms, um, you should, we should be easy to have a stateless authentication system. So you have a dynamic and scalable approach. Once somebody's inside the database, you should be adding context identity and data um, to the decision-making. So it should be real time. Um, this allows you to put very sophisticated and powerful access controls inside the database, move your security inside the database, um, and then um, this will end up allowing you to invalidate the potential for stealing credentials by adding things like context and, and, and identity attributes to your, to your checking. Um, and then on, on multi-tenancy, this allows you to build um, a system that has automatic non-manual deployment of new tenants code an application once and it works in a multi-tenant fashion without really having to do a lot of code. And then you don't have to worry about uh, over provisioning or any manual efforts when it comes to, to multi-tenancy. And with that, I'll hand it off to Eric and he'll show you all how quick and easy this is. Thank you, Matt. I'm very happy to be here today. I'm, I'm going to be talking about a feature that is very near and dear to my heart, and we have a lot of content to cover, so let's jump right to it. Um, I'm going to share my screen here now. Uh, so a little bit of context on the demo itself. We're going to be talking about what it would look like to build a hospital information system using Fauna. Uh, with that, we're going to cover the attribute-based access control, the ABAC, uh, which is how we're going to make sure the data is secure. We're going to talk about user-defined functions. Um, these are, if you, if you have like a, a programming background, these are just as any other function in any other programming language, the ability to um, encode arbitrary uh, queries, um, have them stored inside the database so they can run alongside our data. If you're coming from a more traditional DBA background, you can see them as both like a, a function in the database that you can use to compose complex queries, or because they also uh, have the ability to perform reads and writes, you can also see them as uh, database routines. Um, now we're gonna be talking about, um, all of this is gonna be talked in the context of a multi-tenant use case. With that, um, let's talk about the domain real quick. Uh, we're gonna be talking about a hospital information system. It's a very large problem. We're gonna be focusing on a very narrow section of the problem, which is doctors who are attending to patients, with scheduled appointments. 
And we're going to be going through the journey of Grace. Grace is a dedicated doctor and obstetrician who wants to see her appointments for the day. As patient shows up, she needs access to relevant medical history so she can provide the best service possible. And during the demo, we're going to try to answer the provoking question of how can we make sure that the patient's data stays secure at its source? With that, I'm going to switch over to the dashboard. Um, this is Fauna's dashboard. This is the first thing you see when you log in. Uh, I already have a database uh, set up for this demo today. This, you can see it's a hospital information system database. Um, but it has no collections in it. It has no functions um, because it's a, what we call a parent database. And each one of the hospital data will be stored in its own database. So I have the hospital of St. Louis here and a hospital of St. Mary. And in Fauna, this are logical data containers. Whenever you're creating a new hospital for a system, you can create a new container. Uh, you don't have to allocate memory, CPU, resources. Like it's just one um, data, lean data container that you can use to store data. And you can use Fauna tooling to replicate schema across multiple containers. So you can see here, I have the same schema throughout all this, um, this child databases. And here you get the first benefit of a multi-tenant use case. If for some reason there is a security breach in one hospital and a key or an X token gets stolen, um, they can only see the data in that hospital only. So there's no breach in this scenario that will cause leaks on all the hospitals that are covered by this multi-tenant system. Um, but from the perspective of your application, because the access tokens and the keys to a database um, they are known to have the database scope in them. They're scope to a database in particular. It allows your application to be encoded as if there was only a single database. Every time you get an access token, you're using that access token to run a query on behalf of some uh, user. Fauna will automatically route that query to the tenant database uh, for you. So your application doesn't have to be concerned about how many databases there are. Um, okay, so let's dive into the St. Louis Hospital. And I'm going to show you the collections that I have here. Uh, these are appointments. These are, you know, scheduled appointments from patients to um, doctors, the doctor's collection, uh, medical history. Each entry in this uh, medical history is going to be like one entry in the medical history of uh, a given patient. Um, we have patients and staff members, like nurses, lab technicians, all people that work at a hospital that are not doctors in this case. Um, so I want to show you that Dr. Grace is the doctor with ID number one. And imagine as Grace comes in in the morning, she um, swipes in her card at the door. She's now badged in. She's in the building. She goes to her desktop in her office. Um, the desktop will ask for her credentials, username, and password. They will, she'll, she'll fill that form, and that application will talk directly to Fauna validate her credentials and get back an access token. That access token will have this document, the, doc, the doctor number one associated with it. And every time that application runs a query on behalf of Dr. Grace, it would use that token and that will inform Fauna what's the identity of that query, the identity being this doc, doctor. So with that, um, given that uh, the application has now an access token and wants to talk to Fauna, um, how do we know what a doctor can do? Um, in this case, we're going to be looking at roles. And the first role I'm going to show you in the demo today is the role called doctors. And the doctor's role um, is automatically assigned to every document in the collection of doctors. So this is already the first difference between um, static role-based access controls and Fauna's dynamic ABAC. Uh, in traditional systems, you usually create a user in a built-in uh, system table, and that gives you basically an ID. It's a fixed schema. You can't add information to it. You can have metadata associated to it. And then you have that ID, that user ID, and then you assign, you manually assign roles to that ID. In Fauna, that is a little bit more dynamic. Uh, you define the role, and then you define what are the documents that are members of this role, and that's automatic. So it doesn't matter how many doc doctors I have, they all have this role. 
associated to them whenever they're running queries against the database. And the second portion of the role is the, the what, what are the privileges that this role will grant. And in this case, it has a privilege to read a patient, um, appointments, and medical history. And they all have the privilege to read, which at the surface might sound like it's okay, right? I, I can read patients, I can read appointments. That's what a doctor should be able to read. And one query that the application might be running is something like, give me all the appointments, um, give me all the appointments and give me doctor, the patient, the time and the reason for the appointment. Um, and I'm gonna be using this utility of the dashboard to run this query on behalf of doctor uh, one, which is Grace. So if Grace runs this query, she's gonna see this information and you can already notice the first principle of least privilege being applied here because in no moment we we said that doctors should be able to read doctors so even though you know she is the doctor number one she can't read that document she can't read that information I already got a permission denied if you try to read doctors informations but you can however read all the patient's data you can see social security numbers in here you can see phone number uh, you can see the reason for the appointment, right? Um, so this is Alice just coming in for a pregnancy test. But Dr. Grace can also see that there's some other document, sorry, some other doctor in the system. And Tad is coming to see that doctor and it has it has been feeling tired of short walks. Like that information has nothing to do with Grace. She, she should not be able to see that information. And usually what most applications uh, will do, like what most people will do, will try to build security inside an API or a middleware that even though the database is allowing Grace to see all that information, they're going to keep the database locked behind a wall and everyone will talk to this API and the API will filter what actually comes out of it, right? Um, but that's, I, we, we, we don't believe that's a good solution. We want to we wanna be better than that. So what we advise you to do in this case is to actually not give doctors permissions to read any of this. Instead, we advocate for you to create what we call a security API. And a security API in Fauna is achieved by creating user-defined functions that would serve the same purpose as your API, as your middleware. So in this case, I have a doctor's appointments, which is a function that takes a doctor and takes a date. It will look for appointments matching those criteria, And for each one of the appointments, uh, it's gonna look through and reshape that data in a form that is ready for application consumption. So your application can call this function on behalf of Dr. Grace, and the information will be already masked out. You can see here an example of data obfuscation. And because we don't want Grace to have access to appointments and patients data, we're going to remove that from the doctor's role. Um, but user-defined functions, by default, they run with the same permissions as whoever is calling that function. But Fauna gives you the ability to specify through the role annotation what is the role that should be used by Fauna to execute this code whenever someone's call it. So you can do like, you can let Fauna read appointments if I use the built-in server role, because the server role has authority to read appointments. It has authority to read any collections in the system. I'm using a server role here for convenience, but you can also specify your own user-defined role with the necessary permissions and have it marked here. So you have tight control over the execution body of this function as well. So let's see how we can make, um, appointments and patients secure now, uh, we can come to the doctor's role and we can remove access to patient and appointments. And instead we can give privilege to the doctor appointments function. And the only thing a doctor can do is to call that function. If I save that, go back to the console and try to run again a query on behalf of Grace, I'm gonna run the same query I, I ran before and now I get nothing. By default, all the sets in the system, they are filtered by the documents you can actually read. And because the Dr. Grace can no longer read in appointments, she won't be able to see any of that. 
Um, I can also show you that if I try to go and read some patient um, data, you're not going to be able to read that. The only thing the doctor Grace can do is to call the doctors um, by the doctor's appointments function, calling with her own doctor ID. So I'm going to pass in doctor ID one and the date of today. So now she can see information that is relevant to her when she's looking for her appointments. She can see that Alice is coming in. The data has been obfuscated, and that's the reason for the appointment. So this is the first, um, the first the first innovation that we can show you, like you can build APIs that are secure and that are um, ready for application consumption and eliminating the need for a middleware. Um, but you might already be thinking about attack vectors and one obvious attack vector is the ability to, you know, if Grace's credentials get compromised, someone might call this function and try a different doctor, right? In this case, you can see Tad has um, an appointment, um, and that's the reason for the appointment. She can, you know, whoever steals her credential can just scan through and try different arguments and see what matches and what doesn't. Um, so we're going to introduce you to the core of the dynamic ABAC functionality, uh, which is the ability to set predicates. So um, I can show you that I can add a predicate to the doctor appointments function in the role of a doctor and the predicate on a function will receive the same arguments as the function itself so it will receive the doctor and the date just as the function does and i can build a predicate that says well a doctor should only be able to call this function if the doctor argument matches the query's identity and um what else? And the date is equals to date.today. Query identity is just a function as any other function in the query language. It is available for you always. You can always call this function and get access to whatever is the document that is associated with the user token that is being used to run a query on behalf of someone. So with that, I'm specifying that a doctor can only call this function if it's calling for themselves and the date has to be today. Maybe there are some other use cases in the system where this function can be called with different arguments. But for this case, whenever it's a doctor, that's the only arguments that are allowed. So if I save this and I go back and I try to, again, doctor one, and I try to access some other um, doctor's appointments, I'm gonna get a permission denied now. So if I try to access with my own um, doctor ID, that's, that's the information should be seen. Okay, so how about medical history? If you remember, the doctor's role is still allowed to read medical history. So I can go medicalhistory.all, and Grace is seeing um, all the medical history in the system. She's seeing that patient one, that's Alice. Uh, there's a consent to list. So this entry has been given consent to Dr. One Grace by Alice. And that's a cholesterol level. That's something that is important um, for her appointment. Um, but there's also another entry for, doc, for Alice and she has not given she has not given consent to Grace to see that. That's Dr. Chu, that's another doctor. And that's an X-ray. Uh, and there's someone's HIV test that that person didn't give anyone consent to see. But the roles as has been set are gonna allow you to read all this information. Um, and what we actually the best practice, what we would advise in this case is that you think about the use cases that you have in your application and you, you craft a user defined function that, you know, it's, it's secure. It only exposes the data that is, uh, that the application should see and the application should only call that function. But for the purpose of this demo, I'm going to explore some other functionality that I think is very interesting um, that will allow us to make this medical history secure, even though it's not through a user defined function. Okay. So let's go ahead and remove the ability from doctors 
to read all the medical history. Let's, let's drop that. And I'll show you now the history read only row. And the first thing that it shows is that rows can stack up. You can slice your rows in whatever way you think makes sense for your domain. And rows can have multiple memberships. In this case, the history read only is applied both to patients and doctors. And by the way, there's a predicate on doctor's association with this row. And the predicate says that the doctor has to be badged then. So the doctor has to be in the building. She, you know, Grace is only associated with his role after she swipes in her badge at the door at, and, it, and she's in the building. If she swipes out and goes to have lunch and her desktop is unlocked, no one can sit at her desk and list um, medical history. Like that information is secure. So it adds that context to the security system and it lets you make those decisions. Um, so let's see what, given that you're badged in, what is it that you can do? So it has privileges on the medical history and you can read medical history and there's a predicate there that says, well, if you're a doctor reading a medical history, you must be included in the list of consenting doctors. And also there must be an appointment between you, the doctor and the patient roughly about two hours around the appointment. So two hours later, if you, you know, after the appointment, two hours later, you, you no longer can see this information. Like you have to meet all this criteria so that you can see that information. You can see that medical history for that patient. And by the way, if you are a patient, um, well, you can always read medical history as long as your, it's your own medical history, right? So that allows you to factor in, you know, stuff like data that is available in the database with the context of time to make decisions about whether you can or cannot see some piece of data. So let's go back and see what happens now. If I go to doctor slash one, like Dr. Grace, she tries to list all medical history. Well, now she can only see the medical history for Grace, uh, sorry, for Alice, because she's in the consent to um, list and the appointment is around the right time. Okay. Um, let me hop back to my slides now. And I'm going to go over a few thoughts. Um, with traditional security systems, what you have is you have the ability to group people together. You have a list of doctors, you have a list of patients, you have a list of staff, and those groups are associated with certain permissions. Doctors can read patients, uh, patients can read patients. You know, you have a broad um, spectrum of permissions that are applied to each one of those groups. With Fauna, we give you control of who you are, where you are, in what context, in what time. So it's no longer doctors and patients. This is Grace, who is badged in. She's in the building, and she wants to look at Alice's consenting medical history during the time of their, their appointment together. Okay? So you can see how this severely devalues Grace's credential online. If someone steals Grace's credential or compromise her token and tries to sell that on the internet, a malicious agent buying that information is not going to be able to see anything that Grace can see at the time she can see at the location she is, right? Um, and this is just the beginning. This is just the basic building blocks of much more advanced systems. Um, it's 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 advantageous to me is like simplicity. It's, it's quote unquote, just a query. So by the time you're already familiar with the database, you have already created your schema, you're exploring um, your app, you're evolving with us, um, you're gonna have a pretty good understanding of the Fauna Query language. And that's gonna allow you to create very precise and accurate statements about the security of your system, leveraging all of the information and the context that is available at the database. There's no application overhead. You don't need to build a middleware to secure database when the database is secure. And there's no additional operational cost. You don't need to maintain and pay for servers and all the infrastructure that you need to pay to maintain a service 
um, when your data is not secure at source. Um, and it's highly secure. There's no long sections that can get hijacked. Um, if you go into the database and you, there's a breach for some reason, you want to like change a predicate uh, so that person no longer has that given access, uh, that is applied immediately. Right? Because on every query we evaluate, given the context of that query, what are the rules that are applied to it? Um, and if you change that, it, it really adapts to the changing nature of a very dynamic system. Uh, and there's no overly permissive access. Like there's no way someone is going to still grace his identity and go to the database and get all the medical history and get all the patient's social security numbers because they can't. They can only see what grace can see given the conditions uh, specified. And those conditions might never meet again. Um, so these are the basic building blocks of systems that can be much more advanced. You can have predicates on rights, for example. And you can make sure that whoever is writing to a medical history uh, cannot change the patient. So you cannot steal someone else's entries or you cannot create a fake entry and try to assign to someone else. Like that's one possibility. Um, you can also imagine if you have something like an, an access log, every time someone goes and read medical history, you have an access log and metadata somewhere that allows you to compute a burst function. So you can make sure that reads occur only at a pace that is compatible with human interaction. So someone trying to build a script that will try to read as much as he can will no longer be able to do so. With that, I conclude um, my part of the demo and um, back to you, Wyatt. Great, thank you, Eric. Great, great demo. All right, received a number of questions uh, while you were going through that. So I'll start with the first, um, and I think Eric or Matt, either of you want to take this, feel free to, to, to go ahead. Um, so the question is, does this mean user management has to happen within Fauna, or does it still plug into other sources of user management systems and single sign-on? I can take that. Sure. Um, <clears throat> it does not mean that user management has to happen at Fauna. Um, with the predicates you have in the database, you can, you can leverage all the information that is in the database to make a decision, but we do allow you to create a access provider in the database and associate, associate that with an external access provider. And usually what occurs in that interaction is that whenever you give in Fauna a token that comes from the access provider, uh, Fauna will validate that token with the access provider, and then usually the response comes with some metadata associated with it. So you can control stuff like permissions and roles and, and any metadata at your provider of choice. Um, and when that comes back, the predicates will have access to that metadata. So we can also leverage that information to make our decisions. Thanks, Eric. Um, and yeah, I just threw a link to the section in Fauna Docs that speaks to what Eric just mentioned, if you're looking for some more information. Great. Um, all right, question two. With native multi-tenancy, do we lose any of the single tenancy aspects of traditional DBs, like simple queries that would cover all data that in a multi-tenant scenario would be distributed, that in a multi-tenant scenario would be distributed and could possibly not be accessible? Thinking on reporting queries that would look across all tenants. Uh, I can try to answer that. So when you're building your front-end application, when you're building your mobile app, a browser app, uh, you're going to be using most likely um, either a very narrow key with very narrow access, uh, or you're going to be using an access token that only grants you access to whatever I was showing you right now, like only access to that database, that collection. Um, but if you are building um, some form of analytical um, process and some form of data that needs to cross uh, tenant, the tenant boundaries, um, you do have the option to create a key. And a key, there's there's documentation on it on our website. It's it's taken to be like a secure key that you, you need to make sure that it's stored in a vault somewhere. 
and some types of keys are allowed to cross tenant boundaries. So if you're if you have this hospital information system and you want to run a report uh, that needs to cross hospital um, containers, uh, tenant containers, you would use one of these keys running on a server that you trust. Uh, you also have the option of taking a there's a parent child relationship. So you could actually put some collections in the parent if you wanted to, and then put whatever data you wanted to track in that parent table. So you'd have a single source to go after. And if there's relatively small numbers of tenants, you can actually issue one token per tenant and you could access data directly with, you could actually have multiple connections open at the same time in an app if you wanted to. Cool. Thank you, Eric and Matt. Um, I did throw a link to the keys section of Fauna Docs into chat if you're looking for more, more information there. Um, another question uh, specific to your demo, Eric. What if we want to make that two hour window flexible based on the hospital the appointment took place? That's a great question. Um, you can store that in a metadata collection somewhere. Like you can have a collection um, that contains like uh, the default duration of um, an appointment, for example. And you can read from that collection during the add the predicates uh, code and make that decision. It can be as dynamic as you want. Um, your ability to secure the system is only as good as your ability to reason about the aspects of the system that makes it secure. Um, so you can you can extrapolate that into well, let me look at some collection history and figure out what's the average. Um, duration of an appointment, and I'm going to add a buffer like 10, 20%, and that's going to be the default uh, duration of access to medical history. Like you, you can be very dynamic when making a decision because you have the power of FQL, the Fauna Query language, and you have all the data available in the database to make that decision. So you kind of have two tools at your disposal. Every login is going to have its own identity record. And that is a full on JSON document. So you can put any static or dynamic information in that. So you can embed objects, embed arrays, and that's fully dynamic in real time. Or you can actually query other data. So you can actually go build in a full scheduling system that has other collections with other records in it on somebody's schedule and appointments, and it can go read that other data. Great. Final question. Um, we've we've touched on this a little bit, but probably good to get in a bit more detail. H how does an app connect to Fauna? Is there a driver? Um, I think Matt or Eric, if either of you want to jump in. Eric, go for there's, it. There's multiple drivers and multiple programming programming languages that we support officially. Uh, that includes JavaScript with TypeScript support, uh, Python, Go. Um, that's just on the top of my head. Uh, but Fauna itself uses a, a REST API. So even if you find a language where there isn't an officially supported driver, uh, the actual surface area of an API is, is small enough that uh, some people may choose just to build their own or just talk to Fauna using your favorite REST client. That's also a possibility. Yeah, they're lightweight drivers that you just embed into your app. Um, that have some helper functions for log in, log out, token create, and stuff like that. And once you create your token, then you're just kind of using that to launch queries against it. Awesome. Well, I think I think that's a wrap for today's session. We really appreciate everyone joining. I hope you found this educational. Um, I, I will throw a link to the contact us section. Um, if you'd like to follow up on any of, of the topics we covered today or have any questions or like to go through a demo of Fauna, we'd be happy to set up time. Uh, feel free to, to reach out to us through through that method. Um, but otherwise, have, have a great day. Thank you. Take care.